Before I go into today's teaching, I want to give you a, 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 a brief overview as to why this particular teachings are, you know, I shared part of it on, on Friday, and, and I'm going to continue um, today sharing about the resurrection. Why it means so much to me. I love the Lord. I genuinely love the Lord. And if for no other reason, he has saved me from my sin. And he has been merciful to me all these years. I truly, truly appreciate him. And I know I'm not the only person who feels this way because every one of us feels like we were the worst of sinners. But thanks be to God, he has saved us. When I was a young believer, when I first got born again, I did not know some of these things. And in the early days, I struggled with my Christian walk. I struggled because I did not know how to live for God because the way I had been taught was that, you know, holiness, it was a requirement for serving God. And that is absolutely 100% true. But it was taught in the context of action, meaning that if you're holy, you would never do this or you never do that. And so anytime I would mess up, it would mean to me that I'm not holy. And, and as a result of that, I would have moments when I would just want to quit. And I even had one time when I walked the street and I was telling the Lord why I couldn't continue serving him because I was messing up too much. Over the course of time, God directed me to go to Rhema Bible Training College. It was Rhema Bible Training Center then. And when I got to Rhema, there was a class taught by a wonderful man of God by the name of Bill McNeese. The cl class was called Redemptive Realities. In that class, they began to talk to us. He began to teach us what the Bible said about being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus confirming through the word that holiness was a standard of God. But not holiness based upon action, but holiness based upon right standing, meaning this, that when you are born again, you became a new creature in Christ, and immediately holiness came on the inside. I began to realize that I was holy by virtue of the new birth, not by my actions. And then now came to understand even more that if living from the inside out would empower me to overcome the failings. In other words, it is living from the inside out that was going to help me to live holy. In other words, I don't do things to become holy. I'm holy and out of that holiness I live. I'm supposed to live. I remember the day when I sat in class and I was happy and angry at the same time. I was happy to find out that I didn't have to struggle to become holy because I already was holy by virtue of the new birth. But I was angry because no one had ever told me this. And at that time, I was saved, you know, almost nine years. For a brief moment, I was angry with my teachers, the, the preachers and others who were around me. But then I began to realize shortly thereafter that the reason they never taught me these things is because they really didn't know it themselves. They, they were taught what they, what they were teaching. Their intent was perfect and wonderful, and I'm so grateful for them to this day. I'm thankful to God. Because I've never lost sight of the importance of holiness. Holy living is important. Amen? But I'm not, I don't become holy by virtue of perfection in my behavior. I am holy by virtue of being born again. And then out of my born again experience, I now live out holiness. Glory to God. Thank God for truth. 
in this particular teaching, I just love the way it helped me to understand and to connect with Jesus in not only in his death and burial, but in his resurrection, helping me to identify how Jesus took my sin, how he was made to be sin. He did not commit a sin. He didn't lie, didn't steal, didn't cheat, didn't fornicate, didn't murder. He did none of these things. He never committed a sin. But he was made to be sin. 1 Corinthians 5.21 God took our sin and placed it upon him. And then God could not look upon sin, so God turned away. From, once Jesus made sin, God turned away. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how real it was. It was not a symbolic act. Jesus didn't just go on the cross in a symbolic way. He, he, he was made to be sin. All the sin of mankind was placed upon him. And he bore in himself our sin and died on the cross with my sin and yours. A death that we should have experienced. A separation from God that we should have continued to have. But then because of his death, because of his death, sin was punished once and for all. Now, time didn't permit me to talk about what happened between the cross, you know, at the time he died and his resurrection. But I'm so grateful I was able to learn about some things that Jesus did and what took place during that period of time. But then I was also excited by the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't new to me. I, I had heard about Jesus being raised from the dead from a child. Okay? I mean, in, 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 the, in the Anglican church that I was christened in and, and, and attended in Lloyd's Vale, Jamaica, what is interesting, you know, they would, they would recite the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed spoke about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So from a, from a child, as far back as I can remember, I was made aware of the resurrection of the dead, of Jesus Christ from the dead. But let me tell you something. To have revelation knowledge come to understand what that actually meant, not just to Jesus, but to you and I, that excited me beyond words. To this date... Of all the things that I have learned from the word, and there are many things that have thrilled me, and there's many things that have excited me and continue to do so, nothing thrills me more than that period of time when I sat in that class and learned about the redemptive truths and the redemptive principles. that God had in the word that I had not seen. And that's why for me, this book that we're recommending for you to read this month is so important, Two Kinds of Righteousness. Because you need to understand that there's a righteousness that people try to earn by virtue of their mental assent and their own legal deeds and actions. But there's a righteousness, which is the right kind of righteousness that you need to walk in and understand that comes by virtue of the new birth. It is not anything earned. It is by grace through faith. You and I need to understand it. So let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the privilege today of sharing this word. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide. Holy Spirit, I'm trusting you to unveil, to unfold, to reveal the word of God unto our spirits. I am believing today for deposits of grace and for impartations of truth. So that when we're done, we can say it was good that we came together. Thank you again for the anointing that you've placed upon my life. And thank you for making my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. And I declare that we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we're specifically going to be speaking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, you know, I am going to be teaching... And I might sound like a professor at some points, but that's not my goal. Amen. But I just want so much to remind you or to help you to understand this truth 
so that you can walk in the joy of your salvation in a far greater way than you might even be doing right now. When Jesus rose from the dead, he triumphed over death and hell. <laughs> Amen? He triumphed over death and hell. Revelation 1.18 says that he now has the keys of death and hell. Glory to God. He triumphed over death and hell. And so since Jesus broke the bondage of hell, there is nothing on this earth that can hold us in bondage anymore unless we keep giving place to the devil. The, the freedom that salvation brings cannot be taken away by anything. But you can reject it. And I'm talking to you believers. See, no one can take salvation from you. God will never take salvation from you. But you can reject it and turn away from it. And I pray that's not you. But Jesus broke that bondage of hell. And there is nothing on this earth that can hold us. So listen carefully. When Jesus had paid the full penalty, God was satisfied. We touched on that this past um, Friday. And if you didn't get to hear that teaching, you can um, jump on, either on Facebook or on our YouTube page and see it once it's up. When Jesus had paid the full penalty, God was satisfied. God was satisfied. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and I'm going to read verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read verse number 11. It says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He shall what? See the labor of his soul and be satisfied. That's just a part of the verse. God's justice, God's wrath was satisfied. And that's why death and the grave and hell had to spit him out, so to speak. Amen? Because God's wrath, God's justice was satisfied. Ladies and gentlemen, I have said it before and I'll say it again. I don't know how three days in the grave satisfied God's justice of eternal punishment, but I am so grateful to God. That's why anyone going to hell is so tragic because they don't have to. Jesus took the pain. He took it all. He went to hell for you so you wouldn't have to go there on your own. Jesus spent three days in the grave and hell so that you would never have to go and spend eternity there. And so if you go to hell, don't blame God. Don't blame Jesus. Blame yourself because it is because you have chosen not to accept this great salvation. Some people say, you know, I don't know how a loving God would send anybody to hell. First of all, God doesn't send anyone to hell. Going to hell is a choice that is made by anyone. You have made the decision to reject the truth of God's love through Christ Jesus. But the issue is not God's love. The Lord told me this. He said, son, the issue is not my love. It's my integrity. See, God in his word has already told us the path to eternal life and the path to, to hell. And then he said, these two roads lay before you. Choose one road or the other. And he tells you which road to choose. He tells you the destination of both roads, and then he tells you which one to choose. His integrity will not allow him to force you onto any of those roads. In other words, you make the choice. I've made the choice to go the narrow way that leads to eternal life. And multitudes have done the same. But there are multitudes that have made the choice to go to the other road that leads to eternal damnation. So keep in mind, keep in mind that God's integrity will not allow him to make the choice for you. He has already told you what choice to make, gave you and I the ability to make the choice, and now it's up to us. So don't listen to people in their ignorance who try to say, God will never send anybody to hell in this, as if to say, it is God's choice. No, it's not God's choice. It is yours if you choose to go there. Now, having said that, when God became satisfied, okay, there was a restoration that took place in the person of his son. Amen? Now, let's look at it. One aspect of this restoration was this. Jesus was made righteous. Let me say it again. Jesus was made righteous. When he was made sin, he became unrighteous. That's a spiritual thing. That's not a natural thing. Okay? He became unrighteous with our unrighteousness. 
And so, once God was satisfied, Jesus was made righteous. Okay? He was made unjust so that he could be made just again. So that we could become partakers of his righteousness. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 30. It says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Notice it says, Jesus became for us wisdom from God. And in addition to wisdom, he became righteousness, he became sanctification, he became redemption. Amen? He became. So he had to have been something else in order to become. When he was made sin, he became unrighteous. Now he became righteous at his resurrection. Jesus has been made unto us righteousness. That is why you and I need to understand this then. That our righteousness is in Christ. Amen? And that righteousness could not be made official. Listen to me carefully. It could not be made official until Christ was made righteous as our representative. The moment Christ was made righteous as our representative, amen, it was set to our credit. Come on now. It was set to our credit. In other words, we benefited. Think about it like a bank account. Jesus went to work and on payday, the money showed up in your account. <laughs> Glory to God. It was set to our credit. Glory be to God. Now go to 1 Timothy, please. And there are a number of scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And we are going to read verse 16. Notice what it says. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Now that word justified means to be made righteous. He was made righteous in the spirit. Now my question then is that why would he be made righteous if he was not unrighteous in the spirit? He was justified in the spirit. Then it says, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Praise God. Amen. Jesus was made righteous or justified in the Spirit. He was made righteous and justified in the Spirit. And here's the good news. Everything that I'm telling you about what happened with Jesus at the resurrection, this, ladies and gentlemen, was laid to our credit. That's why you and I can rejoice in our salvation, in our perfect salvation. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read verses 18 through 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. It reads, and by the way, if you're taking notes, write down the references, okay, um, before you even turn in your Bible. So if you, you can always go back and read them. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Jesus was quickened, as the King James says, he was made alive, in the spirit, he was made righteous. So, keep this thought in mind. 
The same moment Jesus was made alive in spirit, he was made righteous in spirit. The moment he was made alive in spirit, he was made righteous in spirit. Jesus was active from the time of his death to the time of his resurrection. He was, listen, and I don't have time to go into all of this, but just keep in mind, he was working some things out. Glory to God. So as believers, you and I, we must understand what happened in spirit, not just what happened in body when we are talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not enough for us to just know that his body laid in the grave and his body um, physically resurrected. We, we must understand that there was a spiritual side to this, not just a natural side. As a matter of fact, that is why the Bible tells us that we need to be spiritual, not carnal. We're not supposed to be living out of our flesh, but out of our spirit, man. Amen. And that's why there are many biblical truths that many Christians reject because they can only they, they only look at it from a natural perspective and they don't ever delve into understanding the spiritual realities. Amen. The physical resurrection is a result of what first took place in the spirit. When God made Adam in the garden, he created his man and he breathed into him his spirit and man became a living soul. Adam was neither mortal nor immortal, meaning he could live forever or he could die. It all depended on his choice. God told them, every tree, every fruit of every tree in the garden you can eat except this one. Why? Because God wanted man to serve him by virtue of love, choice, and obedience, not because he's a robot who had no other option. And, and so keep this in mind. He said, the day you eat of this tree, you'll surely die. When Adam ate that fruit, he did not physically die, but he did die. Why? Because he became spiritually dead. He became separated from God. Jesus' resurrection. As, let, me, let me before I even go back to that. The reason Adam then physically died was because he first spiritually died. Spiritual death leads to physical death. When Jesus died, not only when Jesus was put on the cross, he was made sin, spiritual death. And then his body physically died. He was made righteous in spirit. Glory to God. And his body was raised from the dead. Amen. And that's why when you look in the scriptures, you'll see that the, the disciples, the apostles, they preach a twofold resurrection. They, they reminded people that his soul or spirit, his soul, his spirit was not left in hell. And his flesh, secondly, his flesh did not see corruption. His soul, his spirit was not left in hell. And his flesh did not see corruption. Because what happened in his inward man affected the outward man. Now go to Romans chapter 4. I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures today, but you're in Bible class. Amen. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Glory to God. Romans chapter 4. Verses 24 and 25. Romans 4, 24 and 25. But also for us. But also for us. Amen. Let me read verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him. Believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses. And was raised because of our justification. Jesus now. Here's another thing we need to catch. Jesus was raised for our justification. The word justification also speaks about us being made righteous. His being made righteous enabled us to be made righteous. So when you and I got born again, we were made righteous. We became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why you'll never hear me say, I am a sinner. Because I'm not a sinner. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I tell people, I am is a present tense declaration. I cannot be both righteous and a sinner at the same time. I understand what people are trying to say, and I'm not um, judging or condemning anyone. But personally speaking, I don't call myself a sinner. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Before Christ, I was a sinner. After redemption, I became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not righteous enough myself, but righteous because of him. Now, Jesus so identified with you and I in our unrighteousness. Listen to me. 
that he had to be made righteous so that we could be made righteous. He represented us in death so that he could represent us in his resurrection and in his life. He represented us in his death so he could represent us in his resurrection and in his life. Amen? So you could put it this way that God took Christ, recreated him as our representative so that what happened in him could also happen in us. What happened in Jesus could also happen in us. Now, I don't know if this blesses you, but it sure blesses me. So Jesus was made righteous. This then also helps me to understand that Jesus was the first man that went from death to life. Now, you might, you, know, you see, this is why we have to understand the spiritual versus the natural. Because when you hear me say that, you, you might think in the natural, wait a minute. There are people who were resurrected before they came from death to life. So we can't then be talking about physical resurrection then, can we? All right? Adam, when he died, went from life to death. From being alive spiritually to being dead spiritually. Jesus went from being dead spiritually when he was made sin to being alive, righteous in Christ. Amen? So the only reason, listen to me carefully now, the only reason that you and I can go from death to life, from sinful to holy, from unjust to just, is because Jesus first did. Let me say it again. The only reason we can go from death to life from sinful to holy, from unjust to just, is because Jesus first did. Now, listen to me, folks. You might think to yourself, Pastor Dean, all this stuff going on around me today, it is so frightening. You want to know why I can live in peace in the midst of all this? It's because I am confident of my position in Christ, my standing in Christ. I'm confident he was made righteous so that I could be made righteous. You want to know why I'm not afraid to die? Now, please understand me. I'm not planning to die anytime soon. I have stuff to do. But the reality is this. Death. Death has no victory over me. Can have no victory over me. If I were to die, I'm immediately in the presence of Jesus. I can't be afraid of something that can't win over me. No way. Glory to God. So I, I, I now listen, I take all the natural precautions that I'm supposed to take. I do the things I'm supposed to do in the natural. But listen to me carefully. But beyond that, I trust God to keep me. I'm not afraid. And listen now, the devil tries to make me afraid. He's just like anybody else. I'm not exempt from his temptations. But I talk back to him and let him know, uh-uh, no way. Not giving place to that. No, 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 no. When I need to go someplace, I go there. Trusting the Lord. Do whatever I need to do to be, you know, take precaution. Okay? I go there. I was in a store and waiting to go into a Jamaica um, um, restaurant to pick up something and lined up outside with everybody and I maintained my people distancing, um, you know, spacing, you know. And what is interesting is, you know, I'm, you know, masked, on the whole works. And so I walk in and it says three people only. So one comes out, of people going, so I'm in. And then shortly after this man walks in, I turn and I, sit, turn and I look at him. I said, listen, I said, it says three at a time. Please step out. He goes, do you work here? I said, it doesn't matter whether I work here or not. I am concerned about my health just like anybody else. Could you please step outside, three only? And so he stepped outside. <laughs> Amen. I do my part in the natural. The rest, I leave to God. So, here's the thing. Death had no right to hold him. Why? Because Satan wasn't found in him. Listen to me carefully. Amen. Once Adam sinned, he couldn't say that because he opened himself up for the enemy. Jesus didn't commit any sin. He was made to be sin. See, Adam committed the sin. And when he did, he allowed the devil to take control of him. But Satan had no control over Jesus because Jesus had not committed any sin. He was made to be sin. Amen? 
And because death had no right to hold him, ladies and gentlemen, death has no right to hold the child of God either. Now, please understand me. I'm not talking about physical death now from the context. If the Lord tarries, every single one of us will physically die, even if we live to be the fullness of what God has ordained 120 years. Okay? Okay? Please understand that. When, 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 when the psalmist wrote, and I believe it was Moses, wrote in Psalm 90 about 70 and by reason of strength 80, he was making reference to those individuals that were in the wilderness who God had said, you know, those 20 and above would die. He wasn't talking about God's plan. The Bible says God's plan for man, you know, you know, as a result of man's failings, God's ultimate plan became 120 years, not 70 or 80 years. You can go study it out on your own. So you can plan to live 70 and 80 years if you want to. And I'm not knocking anybody, okay? You know, I'm aiming for the longest I can go. And I'm believing God with his help, I could make it to 120. But don't feel bad. Don't complain or murmur. If I don't make it to 120, that's no, no loss to you. And it will be gain to me. Because guess what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Now, it says Jesus was the first to go from death to life. Revelation. Revelation. Chapter 1. Go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Amen. I hope you're enjoying your Bible class today. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 1, and let's look at verse number 5. Revelation chapter 1, and verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Glory to God. Now, notice it says, he is the firstborn from the dead. The what? The firstborn from the dead. Think about that because, again, it couldn't have been physical because he would not have been the first person resurrected physically in body, but he was the firstborn from the dead, meaning he was the first to go from spiritual death to spiritual life to be made righteous. Amen. It did not say... He was the only begotten. He was, it did not say he is the only born from the dead. It said he was the first born from the dead. That means there, been a sec, there was a second born, a third born, a millionth born. Every person that gets born again becomes born from go from death to life because of the work and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans Chapter 8. You know, when we get back to normal service times, this is why many of you believers need to drop in on our Wednesday night sessions because, you know, the Wednesday night sessions give, give me the privilege of stopping sometimes and, and spending a lot more time on some of these things so that I can really, truly um, get us to the place where we fully understand it. But let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknew, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He might be the what? Firstborn among many brethren. Again, Paul was not here speaking of physical death. He was speaking about the firstborn from death to life. The firstborn among many brethren. When you and I were born again, we were not physically dead. We didn't go from physical death to physical life. We were from being, being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. All because Jesus did it first. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. 18. Listen carefully. It says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Notice the, that term again, Jesus being the firstborn from the dead. Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And we are going to read from verse 30 to verse 37. Again, I know you're getting a lot of scriptures, but again, you're in Bible class. Praise God. Hallelujah. Notice here, Acts 13, starting at verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. 
but God raised him from the dead. He was seen of many days for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised them from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Amen? So notice now, on the day Jesus was raised from the dead, that's what he's talking about here, verse 33, when Jesus was raised from the dead, all right, he is the begotten of God. Not only was he spiritually reborn, but his body was made alive. His body was, did not stay in the grave to rot away like all the others. So even, even as we look at the scriptures, we can see the resurrection of Jesus is something to be celebrated and something that we must embrace and thank God for. Amen. He was raised from the dead, both in the natural and in the spirit. Because Jesus was made alive in spirit, we can be made alive in spirit. Praise God. You and I can be made alive in spirit. He was our representative in death. And he is also our representative in life. Glory to God. I've gone through a whole lot so far. And I just have a little bit more to share with you. Glory to God. Now, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Man, this is a good Bible class. You're, you're a good class today. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 2. Glory to God, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, shoo, but God, <laughs> shoo, but God, who, glory, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, glory to God. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. When did he love us? Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ, together with Christ, together with Christ. Christ represented us all in death and Christ represents us, represents us all in resurrection. The Bible says, hallelujah, we were, Lord have mercy, made us alive together with Christ. And, by, and it says, by grace we have been saved. But not only that, he says, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are identified with Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. When he was raised, we were raised. Glory to God. When he ascended, we ascended. When he sat down in the presence of the Father, we sat down in the presence of the Father. Glory to God. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Shoo, that may not excite you. But Lord knows it surely excites me. What happened in Jesus happened in you and I. Glory to God. Let me say it again. What happened in Jesus happened in you and I. And that's why what happened in Jesus should be important to you and us and I. Because what happened in him happened in us. 
We were made alive together. We were raised together. We were seated together. We were made alive together with Christ. Eternal life was set to our credit when Jesus was made alive. Shoo! Shoo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The same life that brought Jesus from death to life brought us from death to life. Jesus did everything as our substitute and our representative. And that is why we must receive him. And if you are listening to me today, that is why you must receive him as Lord and Savior because it cannot benefit you if you do not receive it, even though it was done for you. It cannot benefit you if you do not receive it. Think about this. It cannot benefit you if you do not receive it. It's, it's like somebody putting money in your bank account and telling you it's there for you. You have an ATM card. You have a card, debit card. You can go and say to you, buy whatever you want and you starve to death. And you're saying, nobody feeds me, nobody's feeding me, but the money's in the account, the card is in your hand, all you got to do is use it. And I'm here to tell you today, if you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, he has done everything for you, glory to God, and it's up to you now to receive him as Lord and Savior, so you can walk in the benefits of what he did for you. It is not enough for you just to acknowledge his resurrection. You need to receive him as Savior so you can benefit from him. So when Jesus was made alive, listen to me, because we benefit from this. When Jesus was made alive, his victory over sin, his victory over sickness, his victory over spiritual death, his victory over the devil was manifested. He is the conqueror. His victory over sin, sickness, death, and the devil was manifested. He became the conqueror of them all. Glory to God. And so the resurrection demonstrated that the victory that he gained over the devil is also our victory. It indicates that everything that is of the devil was defeated in him. And that became our victory. It became our victory. You know, when I was a young believer, I was worshiping at a wonderful church here in the Bronx, New York, church I got born again in, you know, uh, you know, Tabernacle. You know, Tabernacle Church of God. And it was then called Tabernacle Full Gospel. And I remember there was a wonderful brother in Christ, Brother Carson. And, and, and Brother Carson, when he, when he departed to be with the Lord, when, he, even when his body died, greatly missed. And I remember our, our building would be too small for the service, so, you know, it, 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 the service was held at a church in Yonkers. I had never experienced this before. But while we were there and we were getting close to the end of that service, a joy hit the church. Joy, now, this is what you call a home-going or funeral service. A joy hit the church. People picked up tambourines, musicians going, and we started just singing and rejoicing. And this song, no grave can hold my body down. No grave can hold my body down. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, no grave can hold my body down. Folks, we sang that song. We sang it in the church. We sang it while his body was being carried out in the casket. We sang it when we got out on the street. People were looking at us. I don't know if they'd ever seen anybody come out of a funeral service behind a casket singing with such joy. We got to the cemetery and we sang it and we rejoiced. Glory to God. Why? Because his body, and I came to understand later on why that joy filled that church that day. Simply because of the fact that when a man dies in Christ, 
He has won the ultimate victory. Death does not win. The devil does not win. Why? Because Jesus took care of it all. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Satan is defeated. And we are victorious in Christ Jesus. Now go with me to Colossians. Oh, glory to God. Let me see if I can finish this up. I have a lot I'm rushing through, but I trust you're getting something out of it. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Glory to God. Shoo! Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 11 through 15. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 15. In him, in him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle or show of them, triumphing over them in it. The, the King James said he spoiled the principalities. The New King James says he disarmed them. In other words, he stripped them of their power. He stripped them of their power power. When Jesus was made alive, he stripped principalities of their power. He spoiled principalities and powers. When Jesus passed from death to life, he conquered Satan. He stripped him. He defeated him. He triumphed over him. Satan then is a defeated enemy. He's a defeated enemy in us because the same life that caused Jesus to triumph is the same life we have been born again with. And he's a pastor, if, if Satan is defeated in us, how come? It's because we're not enforcing our rights and privileges. We're not enforcing our rights and privileges. We're allowing him to trespass where he has been from, where he has been evicted. Hallelujah. My body, your body, our body, temple of the Holy Ghost, not the temple of the devil. See, that's why I don't understand Christians who are running around looking for deliverance every day. If you're born again, the Spirit of God's on the inside of you, why do you need deliverance every day? The problem is that what you sometimes are calling demonic is just a bad habit that you need to give over to God and allow Him to keep it by putting it on the cross. The reality is this. The reality is this. At the end of the day, you need to enforce your rights and privileges as a child of God. The same life that made Jesus a conqueror of hell and death. The same life that caused him to strip off all principalities and powers. And, 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 you know, and rise triumphant over anything the devil had. That's the same life that we've been made alive with and that is in us. And dwells with us. Glory to God. The same life. The same resurrection power. His resurrection power is moving in this hour. Jesus did all he did so that we may have this victory. We may have his victory, his life, and his triumph. Amen? Because the Bible says we are joint heirs. We are joint heirs. We are joint heirs. When Jesus raised from the dead, when he was raised from death to life... When he was raised from death to life, he moved right out of Satan's control. And so did we. 
The devil thought he had him bound, but Jesus was set free. The devil thought he had us bound, but we also were set free. When we accept Jesus as Lord, his victory and triumph becomes our reality. Let me say it again. When we accept Jesus as Lord, when we accept him as our Savior, his triumph, his victory becomes our reality. Satan is a defeated enemy to us. Amen? Our victory then and our triumph in Christ over the devil must be as real to us as the fact that we are born again. See, you speak to most Christians they tell, that are born again, tell they're born again, but you ask them about their victory over the devil and they begin to stumble. No, 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 no. As real as your born again experience is to you, that's how real your victory and your triumph in Christ over the devil must be to you. Glory to God. Our place of victory in Christ Jesus is just as valid as the fact that we have eternal life in us. The moment I got born again, I have, I have eternal life in me. Glory to God. Amen? And my victory over the devil in Christ and your victory, it must be as valid to you as that. Satan is a defeated enemy. Amen? And he cannot hurt us or defeat us without our permission or our cooperation. Believers, listen to me. You are fighting this fight of faith from a position of victory, not for a position of victory. Notice, you are fighting it from a position of victory, not for a position of victory. Stop seeing the devil as some mighty enemy. He is a defeated enemy. We must enforce that victory and we must choose to walk in that victory. Amen? We're almost done. Jesus broke Satan's dominion in his resurrection. Again, his victory is our victory because he did it in our place as our representative. When Jesus was made alive, death's power was broken. When death's power was broken, Satan's power was broken because Satan controlled the power of death. Let me say it again. When death's power was broken, Satan's power was broken because Satan controlled the power of death. Genesis 3.15. We're almost done. It's been a good Bible class. You've been a good class today. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I know I gave you a lot of scriptures, but as I said, you're in Bible class. Amen? Genesis 3 and verse 15. It reads, God speaking after, you know, the man and the woman had given place to the devil in the garden. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The reality about it is Satan was crushed. God was speaking then about the Redeemer who was coming to defeat the enemy who had tempted the man and the woman in the garden. John chapter 12. Like I said, we're almost done. John chapter 12. I love teaching. Amen? John chapter 12. Two verses. Verses 30 and 31. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. When Jesus died, speaking about his death on the cross, he was speaking about the devil, the ruler of this world, being cast out. And that's why a lot of Christians, by the way, you know, misuse the phrase, God is in control. But that's a whole nother teaching. God is in control. The Bible said Satan is a god of this world. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'll leave you to think on that. Amen? Sin was judged at the cross. Therefore, Satan was judged at the cross. As long as we do not know that Satan is defeated and we enforce it, if we don't know it and enforce it, Satan can still affect us. That's why his number one weapon is deception. Because... He knows that if he can get us to not pay attention to our rights and privileges, he can defeat us. Glory to God. In Matthew 28, 
when Jesus was leaving us, 18 through 20, among the things he told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, you need to understand. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go. He was in essence telling you to go and operate in the same authority and the same power in which he operated in. Before his death, he showed us and demonstrated how his authority would bring the devil under subjection. And now he's telling us, now that I've risen from the dead, and now that you have, you have my grace and my power in you by the Holy Spirit, go and exercise the same power. Romans chapter um, 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Oh, I, I, I'm telling you, folks. I am so excited in my spirit. I'm trying to stay calm so I can finish this up. Glory to God. Romans chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 20. Romans 16 and verse 20. It says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul speaks about... <laughs> Amen. Satan being crushed under our feet. Because of Christ's victory, Satan will be cast away from the earth forever. There's coming a time where Satan will be forever cast away from the earth. But in the meantime, we can still exercise our authority over him. And he can only lord it over those who allow it or are ignorant of it. That's why we are told not to be ignorant of the devil's ways and the devil's devices. Amen. Again, all principalities and powers is subject to Christ. And we are complete in him. All principalities and powers are subject to Christ. And we are complete in him. We are what? Complete in him. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Colossians 2 9 and 10. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue, verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All principalities, all powers is subject to Christ and we are complete in Christ. We are just as free from Satan's dominion as Jesus is because we are complete in him. If Satan cannot dominate the head, he cannot dominate the body. And if the body will simply yield to the head and walk in the authority of the head, then Satan cannot dominate us. When Christ triumphed, we triumphed. When Christ was made alive, we were made alive. And we are to walk in the conscious victory that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ because in his resurrection we were made alive and brought to a place of complete victory over the devil in every area. I trust that you received something today. I don't know, folks, if you received anything, but I sure preached and taught myself blessed today. My, 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 my. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for this truth that was shared today. I understand for many, some of the things that I said may have been new to them and may cause them to have to go back and take a look at the scriptures and rethink what they have been thinking and seeing concerning themselves and who they are as a result of this great salvation, as a result of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I'm praying, Father, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to any person. And the sound of my voice, who has not yet received Jesus Christ as Lord. And if that's you, this is your opportunity right now to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. He died for you. He gave his life for you. He died on the cross that you might have salvation. And if that's you, and you say, Pastor Dean, I need Jesus in my life. Pastor Dean, I, I need to give my heart to Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. And I also thank you that you raised him from the dead to give me life. 
today I declare boldly that I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is your son and with my mouth I confess him as my Lord I receive him as my Lord and Savior thank you for making me your child and I also thank you that I am, you are now my very own father I commit from this day to serve you all the days of my life in Jesus name Amen if you have given your heart to the Lord we want to send you some free material that will bless you and that will help you and so if you, know, if you, if you have a piece of paper write it down right now email us there are two email addresses you can use you can use office at Christ Alive dot org office at Christ Alive dot org or you can email Christ Alive Radio at yahoo.com. Either one, Christ Alive Radio at yahoo.com. You can use either one of those email addresses. You can email us, and we will gladly send you some free material that will help you to grow. We want to help you to find a good Bible believing church. If you're in the New York City area, okay, you're welcome to come here at, to Christ Alive Christian Center once we start gathering back together. You can also call us here at 718-994-0514. Again, that's 718-994-0514. And in Kingston, you may call us at 876-294-2823. 876-294-2823. But again, get in touch with us, email us, call us, and we'll gladly send you some free material. And when we get back to gathering together in the physical house, we invite you to come into fellowship with us here at Christ Alive Christian Center, New York. We are at 4217 Vireo Avenue in the Bronx. That's V-I-R-E-O in the Bronx, right off of East 233rd Street, just across from the famous, well-known um, Woodlawn Cemetery. Again, just come, we, you know, our regular service times, you know, our Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. At, and at 10.30 a.m. And so when we start gathering back together in this format. But again, we look forward to hearing from you. And we're going to look forward to getting you the material that we promised you. And please understand, we don't just want you to make a decision for Christ. We want you to make a lifetime commitment to Christ. And we will help you to grow in your relationship with God so that you can grow and be everything that God ordains for you to be. Listen to me. The Christian life is a good life. It's a happy life. It's a blessed life. Amen. I am enjoying my walk with God and so will you. Glory be to God. Again, I thank you all for joining us today. I just want to remind our Christ Alive members, please, again, um, if any need in your life and we can help in any way, um, call us at, the, you know, at our emergency number, 914 Three seven four five five eight eight during this period of time. Sorry, five five eight four nine one four three seven four five five eight four. During this time, the church office is not open as usual hours, but we are still available to you for any emergencies or any need that requires immediate attention. Thank you all so very much for joining us again today, and I want to wish you all again a happy Resurrection Sunday. I pray that you've been blessed. To all my Jamaican friends, enjoy your bun and cheese. And for those who don't know what cheese I'm talking about, I'm talking about the real tasty cheese, not the other stuff. Bun and tasty cheese. And you know who I'm talking to right now. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, this is an ongoing thing every year because there are some people who claim that it's just cheese food. We don't care. Amen. Easter bun and taste the cheese. We're talking to you Jamaicans. Easter bun and taste the cheese is the way to go. Glory to God. Amen. And I know I'm going to get a text, but I love you all very, very much. I, I miss seeing you. I miss seeing your children. I miss seeing the teens. I miss all of you. Just know you're not just a face in the crowd. You are special to us and we love you. And we are, you know, looking forward to being together in this place again. In the way that we are used to. But until then, keep this thought in mind. Without expectation, there can be no manifestation because your expectation is 
your faith in action.